there's a theme to these songs. The last song we're going to sing is in 198, there's power in the blood. Amen. And I would, I would direct your attention to, to verse 4, because the first three verses, they're talking about being free from sin, but the fourth verse says, would you do service for Jesus your King? And there's power in the blood. Would you live daily as praises to sing? And it's not just that we're saved from sin, even though that's a great truth, but we're saved to the service of God, mm -hmm. the glory of God. We have, we have a responsibility to, to live, to sing his praises, and to serve one another. Mm -hmm. so just, just wanted you to keep that in mind as we sing 198. Feel free to stand with me if you'd like. <laughs> Virginia, basically what he was. 
Uh, he was a prophet of God. He, prof uh, he prophesied for about 30 years uh, during the reign of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. He was a prophet to the southern half of the nation Israel, Judah. Uh, and he actually lived uh, and prophesied down in a small town called Morsheth, down in the southwest corner of Judah. He was a contemporary of Isaiah. Now, if you look in your Bible, the size of the book of Isaiah is quite large, isn't it? And I think that's the largest uh, of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, he's one of the major prophets because of the size of the book. Uh, Micah was his contemporary. Uh, but while Isaiah has the notoriety of being up in Jerusalem, uh, prophesying to the aristocracy, the uppity-ups, uh, in the royal court in Jerusalem, Micah is the prophet to the little peasant folk in the hill country down in the southwest corner. It didn't make his message any less important. In fact, it was almost the identical message of Isaiah. In fact, uh, oftentimes the book of Micah is called the miniature of Isaiah. So he was a great prophet and preached an identical message. At the same time, Isaiah was preaching in the city. He was down there preaching in the country. His message was a message of repentance. He was calling backslidden Israel back to the Lord. Um, it was a message uh, where he was looking forward to the coming of Christ and the the, uh, the kingdom of God eventually, and, and uh, where peace and prosperity would eventually be fulfilled in the kingdom of God when the Messiah rules on planet earth. Amen. He brings a message from God where God pleads with the nation Israel. So it's a, it's a great message, uh, but God pleads with them. Micah pleads. He confesses the sins of Israel. Uh, but that's, that's the message of the book. Uh, probably the focus of the book is in chapter 6 where God has a case against the people of Israel. And, and the big problem with Israel, Paul was writing about it this morning in our adult Sunday school class, is they were focused on the outward appearance, whether it was circumcision or keeping the law or this or that, when the problem was in the heart. And uh, Micah brings this out as does Isaiah that that Israel was going through all the motions. They're, they were keeping the feasts, they were keeping their ceremonies, their sacrifices, all their religious rituals. They were doing everything they were supposed to do. The problem was their heart was not in it. Their heart was full of dead men's bones, like Jesus condemned the Pharisees. Uh, there was an emptiness in their heart. There was no true spiritual love for the Lord. And that one thing that God required of them, they didn't have the full surrender of their lives. And so their daily lives were corrupt. Oh, on the Sabbath, they looked wonderful. They got all dressed up and went to the synagogue or went to the temple and did all the things. But they were just going through the motions. And God detests that. God hates that. That's what Micah's message was about. A little outline of his book, the first chapter, really is announcing judgment against Israel. That's the northern kingdom, the northern half, and as well as Judah, the southern half. Uh, it talks about the reasons for their judgment, the restoration of the remnant. You know, God always has his people, even though you have this great big people, the Jews that are called the people of God outwardly, they don't all truly believe. They don't truly all have faith. They're not really all God's people. God has a spiritual remnant, though. I would assume that would be the same today in our across this country where we have thousands and thousands of churches that claim to be Christians, Christian churches, filled with thousands and thousands of people that claim to be quote-unquote Christians. They name the name of God. They say they're God's people, children of God, but most of them are not. Most do not have genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not trusting in the blood of the Lamb. And their lives, their daily lives, Monday through Saturday, uh, show that they're not true believers. Even though they go to church dress up and they sing in the choirs or whatever on Sunday, uh, they're, not, they're not truly God's people. Uh, but God always has a remnant. And someday God will restore that remnant and ultimately bring in the kingdom. Uh, chapter 3 goes over the sinful state of affairs that is then in existence in Judah. Uh, just like Isaiah was talking about up in, in Jerusalem in the city, uh, the country folk were no different. There was a uh, pre pretense. They pretended to be God's people, but they weren't in reality. 
talks about the future glory revealed in Christ in chapters 4 and 5 and the coming of God's future kingdom, which we still, is still future we look forward to. Amen. When uh, the Messiah, the Christ, is going to descend from heaven and, and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. Amen. Uh, that will, he will then bring in a reign of righteousness, something that no American government ever can do. Uh, no president ever will, or Congress, or Senate, or Supreme Court justices will never bring in a reign of righteousness. It's going to be Jesus himself, the King of Kings, that will do that. Uh, God pleads with his people in chapter 6, and this is where we find uh, our text this morning, um, where God is pleading with his people and bringing a case against them. And then uh, the last few chapters, Micah himself really is lamenting uh, the lack of righteousness he confesses the sins of the nation and uh, rejoices in that God is a God of mercy. And if people will repent, God will forgive. That is the great hope. It doesn't matter how sinful, how wicked, what bad condition a nation is or people or you are. If people would return and would repent and turn to God, confess their sins, God <laughs> is a God of mercy and a God of forgiveness. So that's the, that's the book of Micah. Let's look at chapter 6. We'll set the context for verse 8 by starting in verse 1. Hear now what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O you mountains, the Lord's complaint, and you strong foundations of the earth. He's sort of appealing to the hills, the mountains, because they're always there. It's almost like they had the witnesses of of what my people have been doing and how they've been living. And God's sort of like, listen, sort of, they're the jury almost, or they're the witness pool, whatever, uh, but he's calling them to account. Because the Lord has a complaint against his people, and he will contend with Israel. He will plead, contend with Israel. It's interesting there, if the idea is with Israel, not so much against them. Yeah, I know, it is against them. He's got a case against them, a strong case. Matter of fact, it's an unbeatable case. They're guilty. Uh, but God is going to plead with them. And, 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 and in the next few verses, we're going to see this, that God doesn't just denounce them and have a diatribe against them, but he, he converses with them. He comes down to reason with them and to plead with them and even to listen to them. He asks them questions and, and he would like to, I'd like an answer, God says. What a gracious God we serve, that he would leave his throne in glory, so to speak, and condescend to put himself on equal terms to the people, as though we were coming right down and saying, okay, let's talk about this. What did I do wrong? What have I wronged thee? How hard was I on thee? What have I left undone that was good? What do you have against me? I'm listening. And so God is going to dialogue with them, really. He wants them to answer him. And of course, by calling them to answer, yes, he's a God who will hear and will forgive if they would repent. But it also makes their sin that much more excusable when they remain impenitent and hard-hearted against this God of grace. Verse 3, we have a problem, don't we? Verse 3, it says, Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Testify against me. Go ahead. Here's your chance. Tell me. There's a problem. So the question is, who's to blame? Is it you or is it me? Is it God who's been unfair? Have I been unreasonably harsh? Hard? Have I done you some injustice? Have I been a cruel taskmaster to you? Remember, I'm the God who blessed and called, saved you, and provided for you, and done all these things. And what have I done? How did I weary you with my hardness? He offers to hear their complaints, doesn't he? Testify against me. Go ahead. I'm listening. You got any complaints? I say that to you. Anybody here got any complaints against God? I don't want you to say it out loud. It's not going to be good. Can you ever accuse God of being unfair, unjust, 
unholy, wicked, mean? No. No, we can't. People today don't want to do the same thing. They want to blame God. It's, it's your fault, God. Unsafe people do this all the time, don't they? If God's a God of love, how come this world is in a mess? It's, it. it's God's fault. This tragedy has happened, this terrorism, this war, this crime, all these bad things that happen to people. It's God's fault. Is it God's fault or is it you? No, it's man. Man is the one who rebelled against God. Man is the one who sins, not God. Man is the one who goes his own way. Mankind is the one who's wreaked havoc on planet Earth and caused all these things. It's man and his sin. It's not God. God has done nothing but give us a beautiful creation. The cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. He's given us health and life and breath and all things to enjoy. And he sent his apostles and he sent his prophets and he sent his son to be our savior. He gave his life to save people and to provide forgiveness. And yet people still shake their fists and say, oh, God's to blame for the mess. No, man's to blame. Man is the one who is a sinner and a rebellious and has gone his own way. And now we have the mess that we're in and it's us that's to blame, not God. If, we're, if, if, if it's an evil thing to return evil for evil or to not return good for evil or good for good, then how much terrible is the sin of Israel and us for not returning good for God's good. Or, in their case, they return evil for His good. In Isaiah, of course, Isaiah is kind of like the, the, uh, the big version of Micah, but, but Isaiah uses the illustration of God. Well, God is speaking, and, and he uses the illustration of a vineyard. That I, I bought a vineyard on a fertile hill. I bought the best piece of ground possible fertile hill and I planted a vineyard and I cleared the stones and I did everything and I fertilized and I, I planted my vineyard and, and there it was and I expected it to bring forth good grapes. And what did I get? Wild grapes. Bitter grapes. And God asked Israel in Isaiah chapter 5, what else could I have done? I did everything for you. It's not God's fault, is it? It's not God's problem. The beginning of verse 3, though, I just want to go back there. Oh, my people. That is a very tender phrase. Oh, my people. It's twice. It's down again in verse 5. Oh, my people. Again, because God comes and he's realizing that he is the one who's called these people. He's the one who redeemed them and brought them out of Egypt and gave them his law and claimed them as his people. And yet, look at that. Yet, this is a very tender phrase. Oh, my people. They're mine. They're my people by virtue of creation. They're my people by virtue of providence. They're my people by virtue of... They're under the covenant that I made with them. They're under my law. They're under my promises. Oh, my people. Again, just remind us, the God we're dealing with is not a capricious, hateful, spiteful God. He's a God of love and mercy and grace and tenderness and compassion. Oh, my people, there's a plea. There, there's a wealth of love right in those words. There's a, there's a history of, of God's legacy of love and care for his people right there. Oh, my people. You who are sitting out here today along with me, God is saying to me, you, oh my people. Will you respond to God's plea? My people. God's choice of them out of his free grace. God's giving them the covenant and the promises. And God redeeming them and delivering them. God providing for them and directing them through the wilderness and taking them into the promised land. God defeating all their enemies. Giving them the uh, land giving them the judgments, giving them the prophets, giving them His Word, the oracles of God were committed to them. He's done everything. So who's to blame? It's not God. Verse 4, He's going to uh, share some of the goodness that He's done. Remind them. 
And, you know, he says, testify against me at the end of verse 3. I haven't heard anything. Well, what have I done? I'll tell you what I've done. I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Using the uh, some of the language from the Pentateuch, Genesis, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and we've been studying some of Deuteronomy the last few weeks, God's blessing of Israel as he brought them out of Egypt through the wilderness to the promised land. And he reminds them even of, of, of those words there, uh, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. That ought to ring a bell with you people. God's provision for them. I gave you a leader. I gave you someone to direct. I gave you someone to instruct. I gave you a mediator to, to take my word and my will and give to the people. Moses and, and Aaron. I not only gave you Moses the leader, I gave you a, pro, a, a priest. <laughs> Uh, the priesthood. I, gave, I set up, I gave you the tabernacle in my place and the Ark of the Covenant. I gave you a means by which you could atone for your sin and maintain fellowship with me through the priesthood, through Aaron. And Miriam, I gave you a prophetess. I gave you a songster. I gave you a worship leader. Remember, and, and even remember of Miriam should... Hark back to Exodus chapter 15. Remember when Israel came out of Egypt by that great miracle of the dividing of the sea? And you passed through on dry ground and the Egyptian army, number one in the world, followed you, closed it up and destroyed them. And we got on the other side and Miriam led you in thanksgiving and praise to God for His wondrous works. That's what you still should be doing. But, but you're not, are you? So God brings up and reminds them of all of His goodness. That they were slaves in Egypt and He saved them from that. In fact, before that, they were pagans in Chaldea. And God called them. God extended His grace, His arm of grace and love and called them to make Him His people. Give them the promise. God's goodness. That's kind of set against their wickedness, their disobedience, their unthankfulness. Verse 6 and 7. Oh, before we get to there, there's another word there. He says in verse 5, Remember, O my people, remember now. In fact, that word remember is a couple times, and it's, it's remember now. And again, even that is a... Uh, it's not a, a derogatory term, uh, like he's throwing it in their face, but do remember. It's almost a pleading remember. It's a, it's a gentle remember. Please, recall this. Remember how good I was to you. So again, just reminding us of the mercy of God toward his people. Remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled. And what Balaam, the son of Peor, answered him. Uh, just a couple things else to remember. He says, uh, now sometimes God sent human blessings. Uh, Moses, Miriam, Aaron. These were people that God sent to guide, direct, provide, be a blessing to my people. But sometimes he didn't just use human instruments. He used supernatural means. When, For example, when he turn the curse of Balaam into a blessing. God does supernatural things too to bless his people. And then he says, remember, from, from Acacia Grove to Gilgal. From Shittim to Gilgal, the, the two places there. And, and uh, uh, Shittim, or Acacia Grove, was a place where they fell into terrible sin. Again, this was over on the other side by Moab there before they went into the Promised Land. And, and they fell into grievous sin uh, and played the harlot and idolatry and immorality and intermarriage. And, and uh, Moses called for the leaders of Israel, the leaders that he brought forth and strung up and hung before the Lord. Because God was so displeased <coughs> with God's blessing. And he brings them into the land in Gilgal. And there in Gilgal, the Ark of the Covenant rested there while God's people uh, defeated the enemy in his power. And the, says that there in Gilgal, the, the reproach of Egypt was rolled away. 
So just think back to all the things that God has done for you through human means, through miraculous means, through blessings and everything he's done. Just remember that. That you may know the righteousness of the Lord. And so back earlier when he says, who's to blame? Is it me? Go ahead. I, is it me? No, I've done nothing but good. I've done nothing but good for you. Everything you could possibly want or need by way of promise or hope or blessings or covenant or in reality, I've done for you. Remember the, the wanderings through the wilderness? The provision of manna and quail and water? Defense from your enemies? Remember Deuteronomy chapter 8? Your garments did not even wear out on you for 40 years. Nor did your foot swell these 40 years. Forget all that? No, God is the righteous one. It's man who's sinful. It's you who are disobedient and, and, and rebellious. It's not God. He's nothing but righteous, faithful. And so then the people say in verse 6, with what shall I come before the Lord? Don't get fooled here now. Don't get fooled here. It almost looks like they're repentant, doesn't it? It almost looks like, oh, we're sorry. What? Well, we're sorry, Lord. What, what can we bring you? With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? This really sounds pretty pious. Oh, oh we're sorry, Lord. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? It's all it's over there saying, uh, you name it, Lord, we'll bring whatever you want. Sure, we'll, uh, just, uh, just you name it. Here, let me write these things down and uh, we'll be sure to get these things done and uh, everything will be okay then, right? <laughs> what they wanted to do is bring some external offering, pay them off. You name it, we'll a thousand rams, uh, yep, a river of oil, sure, we'll do that, sure, sure, we can do that, make everything all right. External works is what they wanted to do. <laughs> man, sinful man has always had that problem. They just give me a list of things I can do to make, make God happy in the burnt offerings and sacrifices as he does in obeying the voice of the Lord. Amen. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken to him is better than I forgot how the verse goes there. The fat of rams, right? Offering them all these rams and, and, and sacrifices. Oh. God doesn't want our payment of external things. It says a couple of verses here. Well, I don't know where those verses are. Oh, he says in Amos, this is where it is, I'm sorry. I hate, I despise your feasts. I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fattened peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. But let justice run down like water, and righteousness like a rain stream. <coughs> God wants their life. He wants righteousness and justice out of their life. They wanted to come before him with all these sacrifices. And God's saying, I don't want thine. I want thee. Amen. I don't want what you got. I want you. I want your heart. Isn't that what we learned in Deuteronomy a week or so ago? That just last week? Now, Israel, what does the Lord require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, and to love Him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, to keep His commandments, the commandments of the Lord, and His statutes, which I've commanded you to say. He wants total surrender of your life. That's what He wants. He said, oh, I'll go, I'll get baptized. He wants that. Well, he wants that, but he really wants your heart. He wants total surrender of your being. So verse, we finally come to verse 8 here. He has shown you, 
old man. They're asking, what do you want? What do you want us to bring, Lord, to make this all okay? And the Lord says, he's shown you, old man. And Micah says, he's already shown you. He's already told you. <laughs> the law was full of it. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. The rehearsals of the law. When Moses kept on rehearsing the law, and in Deuteronomy there, chapter 30, well, most of the book of Deuteronomy where he rehearses the law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And these words which I teach you, you shall teach diligently to your children. That's what he wants. He wants the love of their heart, full surrender. And he's told them in the, in the law and the rehearsals of the law and Moses' reminders of them over and over and the uh, prophets' admonitions over and over and over. The prophets kept saying what he wanted. To love the Lord. To fear Him. To walk in His ways. I don't want you just coming on Sabbath and offering these sacrifices and singing. I want your daily life to be sold out for me. And if it's not, then on Sunday or on the Sabbath, I don't want to hear your noise. You imagine what God thinks of a lot of churches today. They're singing. God is just plugging his ears because it's all noise. I don't care how pretty it sounds to humanly. All their worship courses and all that. Unless their lives truly are sold out to God in full surrender throughout the week. <coughs> it's nothing but noise on Sunday. <coughs> So Micah says, he's shown you. I'm not going to tell you new stuff here. He's already shown you. Over and over and over, he's shown you what the Lord requires of you. What does the Lord require of you? What is good? Well, it's good because it's of the Lord and it's for the Lord. And it's, of the, it's a requirement with the Lord. And there's three things here. One, to do justly. I want your lives every day. I want you to live righteously. I want you to do what is just, holy, pure, what is right. In other words, I want you to keep my commandments. I give you my commandments so you know how to live. Not how to please me and how to earn your salvation. But I give you these because this is how to live justly. It's how to live holy lives. Do justice. Do justly. Exercise righteous judgment, justice. Give to everybody their due. Do as you want them to do to you. Do everything in harmony with the law of God. You see, the laws, God's laws, define what justice is, what righteousness is. The law, but Paul says this in Romans chapter 7, the law, it's holy, the commandments are holy, just, and good. And when we keep God's commandments... We're doing justly, righteously. In other words, God's laws, His commands throughout His Word define how to live a righteous, just life. Amen. <clears throat> when you do not lie and you do not steal and you do not commit adultery and you do not defraud people and you don't gossip about them and you don't slander them, but rather your tongue is seasoned with grace and you uh, let every one of us... Uh, Please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. That's what God wants. And if we're not doing that, then we're not keeping God's commandments as laws. And so the commandments of the God, Lord are, are good. And so we're to do justly. And to love mercy. Mercy is treating people, treating people with kindness and goodness who are in a miserable condition. Not only in a miserable condition, but deserve to be in that miserable condition. They made their bed, let them lie in it. No, that's the exact opposite of love and mercy. Mercy is when you see people that are totally unworthy and undeserving and in a mess. Mercy is being kind and gracious and helpful. <coughs> like this, this, the Samaritan was to this beat-up Jew. Good example. <coughs> Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the merciful. 
Luke chapter 6 tells us, therefore, be merciful just as your Father in heaven is also merciful. Was he merciful to you, a wicked, rotten, rebellious, undeserving sinner? He sure was. Was he merciful to Israel time and time and time and time again? He sure was. How do you think we ought to live in this world? Merciful. Let me take that a step farther. He doesn't just say be merciful. He says, love mercy. I want you not just to be merciful. I want you to crave mercy. I want you to love being merciful. I want you to be seeking opportunities to be merciful. Look around. Find people in need. Naked, destitute, rotten, bummed, whatever. Miserable, sinful, undeserving people. Reach out to help them. Reach out with the good news of the gospel of Christ. Reach out to clothe the naked. Feed the poor and hungry. Be merciful and love it. And walk humbly with God. God hates pride. At a good workshop, Grant's going to do a thing on work with pride apparently on a Wednesday night here in a few weeks. Give a little report on our men's adventure. But... Uh, Pride has many subtle ways of showing itself in our lives. And God hates pride. In fact, it says in, in James and 1 Peter that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And we're therefore supposed to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that in due time He might exalt us, lift us up. Humble walk with God. We can't really help it when you stop thinking about it. our walk with God. He is God. He's Lord God. He's the Creator. He's the Infinite Holy One. We're peons. Of course we ought to be humble before God. But you know our humble walk with God also needs to be humility before others. Not holier than thou. Not judgmental and critical of others. A humble walk with God and before others. So that really sums up what God says. That's what kind of life I want. I don't want a bunch of offerings and feasts and singing. I want people whose lives are sold out to me. And you live them every day. Following righteousness. And pursuing mercy. And humility in your walk with me and before others. Now the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 23. He indicted the scribes and the Pharisees because of their hypocrisy. And he says this, he says, you pay tithe on your mint and anise and cumin, but have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faith. In the Luke passage, it actually says the love of God. Your humble walk with God. Your faith, your dependence upon God. In you. Those are the weightier matters that God wants us to do. Don't leave the others undone. He expected them to tithe on, on all their things and to do all the other things. But those are worthless. They're meaningless if your heart isn't sold out to God. Those three is really the summation of what God wants of us. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this instruction. Pray, Lord, that we would get our eyes and our minds off the external things of this world and even the external things of religion and get back to concentrating on what you desire of your people, and that is a holy, humble life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, rather than close with a song today, I would like you just to huddle together. If you want to walk over and sit with somebody else, get in groups, two, three, four, five people in the pews anywhere, and, and just, just pray. Just pray. Uh, if you want to share with maybe, maybe one of these areas you really struggle with, I'll tell you right now, pray for me that I would love mercy more. I, I too often see people and think to myself, so who deserve it? That's not mercy. But if you want to share with an area of weakness in your life, you need people to pray with you. But let's just get together and pray. Pray for the people of God. Pray for our church. That these would be what would manifest itself in our lives. And when you're done praying, you're, you're dismissed. <laughs>